Welcome to In the Interim. I'm Bruce Mueller, Interim Dean at the University of Michigan College of Pharmacy. Thanks for joining us today. Got a really special guest today that I'm so excited to uh, meet with and, and spend the next half hour or so with, and that's, that's Jim Stevenson. Uh, known Jim a long time. He's currently Vice President for Medication Systems Strategy for Omnicell, but he's also a professor in our own College of Pharmacy. Uh, I knew him first when he was Chief Pharmacy Officer at the University of Michigan Health System and uh, served as Associate Dean for Clinical Services at the College of Pharmacy. I'm really happy to have Jim here to talk, catch up with him and see what he's working on these days. But Jim, uh, our tradition is the first question always has to be, what are we looking at in your background? I'm, I'm hoping that's live and you're really there. Uh, I wish, yeah. and thanks Dean Mueller. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, yeah, this, uh, I was asked to put up a background that was something personal. This is actually a, uh, a picture of my favorite dive site in the world. Uh, it's a shore dive in, on the Northwest Point of Grand Cayman. And uh, yeah, you can, over my, well, I guess it would be my right shoulder, there's a little uh, ladder that leads down to the water and you can see the little channel with some snorkelers in it. And if you follow it out to where the, the water turns darker blue, that's a wall. And on those, that wall, you can go left or right and it's just the most fantastic diving you could imagine. How deep, how deep does this wall go? That's called the mini wall. That goes down to about 120 feet or so. If you continue going out a little bit further, uh, it goes down into the thousands. Uh, I, I don't can't hold your breath that long. <laughs> <laughs> and so, what's the coolest thing you've seen? Well, if you go out to the the thing here and you turn to the left, about uh, 20 yards to the left is a big overhang, and underneath it, there's about 30 tarpon that are, you know, tarpon are about three feet long, big. Yeah, cool. You just swim right into the school of them and they just sit there and watch you and you watch them. That's one of the fun things. I'm, I'm a fisherman. I've caught one tarpon once in my life and I would, <laughs> I would like to repeat that uh, as soon as I can. It would really be cool. Well, let's, let's catch up with you. You, like, as, I, as I said in the introduction, you were a, a faculty member with us and you were actually chief pharmacy officer and ran the, the pharmacy operations for what, what is now called Michigan Medicine. And, you know, from, I think back from when you started and I started to, you know, the, the machine that that pharmacy department is today, it's, it's really an amazing transition and you get tons of the credit for that. Um, to talk about what was that like for you? Because you were actually a pretty young person jumping into be this kind of a role. Well, I don't know if I was young, but um, yeah, younger than now. <laughs> you you started there pretty not too long after I right. did, so right. you saw a lot of the same things that I did, and were a big part of the advancement that we made there. When I and when I think back, uh, you know, there was a the department was one that um, Michigan had a great reputation because of people like Harvey A.K. Whitney and Don and Gloria Frankie and very, you know, very prominent health system pharmacy leaders. But really at the time that you and I came on board, um, wasn't the best period for uh, uh, hospital pharmacy at the University of Michigan. Things had not really progressed the way they should have. And I know when I got there, there was, um, you know, a real lack of what I would say would be, um, uh, top line clinical services. We didn't have clinical practitioners in a number of key areas. Um, and of course, back then, our systems were largely manual. You know, we didn't have computerized uh, provider order entry. We didn't have barcode scanning. We didn't have smart pumps, all the things that maybe we take for granted today. So um, you and I and our colleagues, we really, I think, um, over the next 15 years, uh, really made a lot of progress, implemented a lot of new programs. We added a lot of new clinical pharmacists and faculty. And really, uh, one of the things I'm most proud of, I think, is integrating pharmacy education with pharmacy practice. I think we created great um, learning opportunities for our students. Yeah, I, you, were, you were able to demonstrate need in so many different areas from intensive care units to transplant to in, out, outpatient and inpatient things. And 
we, we found out the solutions were, were pharmacists who, who just did great things. And, yeah. you know, but, but a lot of it had to do with the research that, that was done or the documentation that was done by all kinds of people to demonstrate you know, such a need. I think the system didn't know how much they needed pharmacists and it was, it was great that we could document it. Yeah, actually when I think back to the start, you know, I had to sort of sell to people that pharmacists could do things. And I think by the time I stepped away and, and let Stan Kent and others come on to take over, um, we were actually at a point where people were asking for pharmacists all the time, which was, uh, I think, a real sign of success. Right, and to do new things and to solve new problems, which was, which was really great. No, I agree with that. So we've got a big audience, actually, and audience members, there's a Q&A function here, or you can chat a question, and I want to make sure we answer any questions, or if you want to unmute and ask a question, you could, you're welcome to do, to do that as well. Uh, so you, you did that for a lot of years, you were Chief Pharmacy Officer, and then when you were zigging, all of a sudden you zagged, and you went to Visanti, and you can tell people what that is, but then why'd you do it? Yeah, I, you know, I got to a point in my career where, um, you know, I had been basically doing very similar things for about 30 years. Um, I had been a director of pharmacy or chief pharmacy officer in three different academic medical centers. And I, you know, I found I got to a point where, you know, I'd been doing this for 30 years. And while University of Michigan was the most phenomenal place for me to be a chief pharmacy officer, I couldn't be, you know, more grateful for that opportunity. I just felt like I was getting to a point where I needed something new. And so, I, you know, I explored some things. I looked at some opportunities and, uh, you know, to get more involved in academia. Um, but I also had some, some folks who were colleagues of mine um, who were asking me about maybe coming and working in a consulting capacity to help other health systems. And that's uh, the company Visant. Um, uh, I won't go into the details, but I got asked to come on as president there. And, you know, I finally got to a point where I said, you know, I, I don't, I want to do something different uh, for maybe the next 10 years of my career. And so I pulled the trigger and I kept asking myself if I was stupid for, uh, you know, giving up this fantastic um, position I was in at the University of Michigan. But I, I decided I really needed some new challenges. So I took that and um, did that and I worked uh, with a number of people. It gave me a chance to work with many different health systems to try to help them advance their practices around the country. And I actually um, enjoyed that quite a bit. It was different. It, it did give me that new challenge. Um, and so that's how, I, that's how I sort of shifted into a different direction. But then you really shifted into Omnicel. Well, I mean, there's no, there's, <laughs> So, like not, our audience may not know what Omnicell even is, yeah. but you're in a new technology area now. Yeah. So one of the things, so what happened was I was, uh, you know, the president of Visant, and I got a call one day from the CEO of a company called Omnicell, which is a big pharmacy technology company. And they were the provider of the, most of the pharmacy technology that we used at the University of Michigan. So I was a customer for many years and I, so when you say technology, let's, just, let's back up so the audience is like, what kind of technologies are we talking about? So I'm talking about things like robots, uh, automated dispensing cabinets, uh, dispensing carousels, things like that. And, um, you know, during the years that we were a customer of Omnicell, I would talk to the CEO every year and basically tell him all the things I thought he should do uh, in his company. And um, so we had a pretty pretty long-standing and, and good relationship. Well, out of the blue one day, he called me and he said, Jim, I've got this idea that I call an autonomous pharmacy. And I really, he said, I've got a company full of engineers and, you know, Ivy League business people and all this sort of thing. And they just don't understand it. I need somebody to function like a chief clinical officer who can really explain this to people, help them set the priorities, and really help me achieve this vision of this autonomous pharmacy. And I remember telling him, I said, Randy, I've been thinking about this problem for about 35 years. And if you're serious about investing the kind of money you're talking about in doing this to help pharmacy advance, 
then I'm willing to listen and, and talk. And so I went out and I met with the senior executive team. And about, in about a week, I came back and I told my wife, I said, you know, I think I'm going to change my plans here because this is just too exciting. And, you know, within a month or so, I had uh, agreed to uh, take this position with Omnicell. So what's an autonomous pharmacy? Are, are you going to put me out of a job and everybody else out of a job with this? Well, that's part of the challenge in describing this. You know, I think, you know, if you, if you stand back and you hear about um, AI and whether that's going to put people out of business. So there's, there's definitely fear of that. And it's probably somewhat a, a realistic fear because, you know, if people don't harness this and use it in ways that are beneficial, um, I think there is an opportunity to potentially, you know, have risk to certain jobs. I, you know, I won't uh, dismiss that. I think that's a real consideration. It's, it's no different, though, than when people said, I remember when we put in um, CPOE, uh, provider order entry, pharmacists were at the time, pharmacists and technicians were basically taking pieces of paper that uh, prescribers had written the orders on, and they were then typing these things into a computer and checking them. And they said, oh my gosh, when we have a computer to do that, it's going to eliminate all the jobs of all the pharmacists. Well, guess what? It didn't. <laughs> there were plenty of problems for pharmacists and technicians to work on. And as we move to a more autonomous system, I think the same thing will happen. I'm pretty confident it will. And it's because, you know, in healthcare, the problems are so large. Um, when you think about the medication use system in a health system, it's extremely complex. I, I have a slide that I use internally, and I've used it externally as well, that to run the medication use system at the University of Michigan, it required us to maintain 56 separate systems. So you add technology, but it adds complexity because these things don't integrate together. And it requires a lot of human effort. And if you look at pharmacy practice today, you'll see that there's still a lot of manual um, activity that's going on, repetitive tasks that haven't been um, automated, uh, people sort of keeping things uh, in sync. Uh, and those are all opportunities for um, safety problems. There's uh, opportunities for um, lack of efficiency. Uh, you know, we're talking a lot about burnout today with, with pharmacists, and um, I'm convinced that the complexity of the systems and the pressure it puts on the individuals is, is so great. So the idea, you know, as we look at many industries are, are adopting digital technologies and automation to try to make things work better together, to automate repetitive tasks, and to utilize... Um, data and analytics in ways that really support and help, in, in this case, pharmacists to make better decisions, do things more efficiently, um, and ultimately produce better medication outcomes for the patients. And, you know, that's going to impact efficiency, costs, safety, regulatory compliance. There's, there's so many opportunities there. You know, when students are in school, they learn about drugs, and then they sort of go out on the experiential and they see how they're applied, and we get to do some behind-the-scene things in our IPPs and, and different rotations and drug information rotation, all these kinds of things. But I, I think they're most surprised to find out how much technology is actually involved in all this. It's, it's very little. There's the drug product, but, you know, when you go to the ASHP meeting and you look at all the vendors that are there, they're not vending about a drug. They're vending about the kind of technologies like that Omnicell has. And it's, a, it's amazing how much technology is, sort of makes this machine run. Yeah. And, you know, I've being in education, too, I've thought a lot about this. And I, I know you have, too. But what should we be teaching students in school because the reality is the amount of information out there you know it used to be well you go to school and we'll have you learn and memorize everything to know about the drugs and how to use them well that's way past any human's capacity today so it's not so much about i, I mean i think you still need to teach people a baseline of, of information facts but I think more of it is learning how to find the information you need and how to apply it 
and, and hopefully how to use technology to do that in an efficient and effective manner. Well, I'm sort of interested, you, you have a, uh, sort of the audience, you, you've got a PharmD, you were a, you were a clinical pharmacist for a time, a rounding pharmacist, you were a board certified pharmacotherapy specialist. How important was the clinical knowledge that you had to have a position like you have today? Um, or the I, position, I maybe it, the position you had earlier, I mean, as, as chief yeah, pharmacy officer. Yeah, you know, I get that question a lot because, you know, particularly students that are thinking about going into residencies and, you know, you know, there's these uh, combined master's administrative residency programs and people say, well, should I do that or should I go pursue clinical uh, practice first, get some clinical chops and then uh, move into more administrative things. And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to that. But for me, uh, you know, I went the clinical route first. In fact, I never got any real formal uh, administrative training back in the day. Uh, you could get jobs like I did without it. I don't think you can do that anymore today, but I've always felt that the way I, I wouldn't change it at all. I, I really felt like my clinical knowledge helped me um, communicate more effectively with physician leaders, with the p and committee, um, it, with my own uh, clinical pharmacy staff that I worked with. Um, and I've really valued that clinical experience I had uh, near the beginning of my career. So if a student wanted to get involved in some of the technology side, last, uh, our last meeting was with Bruce Chaffee who really talked about informatics and really stuck mostly about the informatics and applying that to improve patient care. But there's this whole other sort of physical technology piece as well that generates information and more informatics. How, but how does a student get involved? Because you and I talked in the day about could we get robots into the College of Pharmacy and have people see what an OmniCell is and how to program these things and what information you could draw. I don't know how we could ever do that, although I would love to do that. I'd love to see a room like that in a new College of Pharmacy building, you know, someday. But the problem is that's stuff probably goes out of date pretty fast too. Yeah, exactly. Um, because I don't think the, I don't think it's necessarily, you know, how do you operate the, the device? It's more, how do you think about how to use these types of tools to get the outcomes that you need? And, you know, that requires a different kind of thinking that I think even I'm a little bit critical of the way we talk about informatics and things right now, because I think often people are talking about more of the tactical, mechanical things about, well, how do you implement, uh, you know, a, uh, an EHR or how do you implement this thing? And that's, that's fine. It's, people need to know how to do that. But I think the real piece is how do you develop a strategy and a vision of how all these pieces should work together to produce the best possible outcomes you can um, and how you're going to uh, move towards a more perfect medication use process in the future. And there are, you know, there's a lot of visionary people out there. There's somebody um, you probably know, and if you haven't had him on your, um, you're in the interim, I would recommend that you get him. And his, his name's Alan Flynn. Um, Alan, I think he works in the uh, medical school right now, but he's a pharmacist. He's one of the most visionary people I've run across. And really at Michigan, I've been so fortunate to work with some great people. Bruce uh, Chaffee, Alan Flynn, Joe Lassiter, um, Scott McCready early on, I brought him over when I came to Michigan. Uh, you know, he's got a couple things in the Smithsonian Institution that we developed at Michigan. Um, so, uh, you know, those kind of people have a vision and uh, they think strategically about how automation, informatics, uh, data intelligence can be harnessed to produce the outcomes that you want. They're, they're basically tools. And, the, and these are pharmacists who are doing these, you know, you talk about Scott and Alan and some of these others. It's, uh, it, but, so I guess a pharmacist can be really involved in this, but when, when I think about the innovation, I heard you say that the people that you're working with are also from all walks of life. You, yeah. your, your team has really got a bunch of different kind of people on it. Yeah, it's one of the most, people ask me, well, what surprises you? And it's like, I, I always say, I have no idea how this company was ever successful in solving any problems before, because there's all these brilliant people, but they don't understand what pharmacists do, what the medication use process is. So they're, 
they're trying to solve problems that they don't fully understand. And I actually think that's been one of the biggest areas where I've been able to bring value to the company is I can help them say, these are the problems we need to solve. Let's prioritize this. This You're on the right track or you're not on the right track. So that's... That's been a, a real because you know, there's engineers there's 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 engineering that I didn't even know was engineering that you know yeah. the human process aspect to it that I guess I never thought it was engineering but it is engineering. Yeah. Um, so, as people in the audience again, if you'd like to ask a question, go ahead and use the Q and A function. Uh, we've we've got some rolling in here already. Um, one of the questions the students asked is, do you do you need an MBA? to hold a leadership position within pharmacy? Is that is that the route or is there something better? Well, I don't know if you need, I don't think you need an MBA, um, but I would say for top tier academic medical centers, um, people are looking for, uh, you know, credentials to help differentiate you from other people. And it's becoming more and more common that people have a administrative residency experience and some sort of a master's whether it's an MBA, an MPH, often there's, there's programs that have uh, master of science degrees in pharmacy administration. Um, so those are probably fairly typical um, credentials that you would be competing with if you wanted to get into that type of a role. Are you, so kind of talking about all these sort of things, are you optimistic about the future of pharmacy? I mean, we talked a little bit about how some of this technology could, could remove jobs and really if you just want to be the next automaton pharmacist and think that's going to be your career for 40 years I think you should be worried but yeah. are you overall optimistic and if so where do you where do you see the the optimism I'm very optimistic um, I you know and I think the optimism is because I've seen what pharmacists can do when we're put in the right position to solve problems and I actually think that uh, you know if you look at the data today from ASHP, they do workforce um, survey every few years. Pharmacists, in the last survey, which was done in 2018, hospital health, health system pharmacists only spend 25% of their time on average on clinical activities. And you know, you and I know from you know, our, our experience, there are so many opportunities. If you could free up pharmacist time, there are so many problems to be solved and um, you, there's so much value to be added. And that's why I think I'm optimistic. And that's why I think, like I say, I, I'm not concerned if we do the right things. Technology will hopefully take away the 20% of pharmacist time that's spent in drug distribution. Um, you know, that to me, almost all of that should be able to be automated and run by technicians and technology. So you take that 20%, you shift that over into clinical activities. 40% of pharmacist time today is spent in order verification. And if you've ever, you know, seen pharmacists sit in front of a computer screen every two seconds, hitting the enter button as they go through, you know, hundreds of orders. Well, you know, more sophisticated data analytics and artificial intelligence can really um, sort through those that really should be sort of automatically approved and then filter out the ones that really require the pharmacist to look at and, and spend some time on. So if you, you know, if you could get rid of 20 per, or let's say 30% of that, you've got another 12% of pharmacist time that again could be put forth to uh, clinical activities where there's really a strong need. What, what kind of cool projects are you working on these days? Well, I'm working on this autonomous pharmacy. We've got an advisory board, and actually, if any of the audience wants to go online, there's we have a website, www.autonomouspharmacy.com. Uh, you can read a white paper, and we've got another paper coming out in uh, American Journal of Health System Pharmacy uh, shortly. I don't know the publication date, but it's in press. Um, but uh, so I'm working with a lot of health system pharmacy leaders on the vision for that and how we we move that forward. And it, this is not an Omnicell thing. When you go to that, you won't, it doesn't look like Omnicell. It's not Omnicell. This is, we're trying to make this an industry movement. Um, so that's, I'm excited about that. And I'm spending most of my time trying to, trying to advance that to help uh, practice. But I've got some other really cool ideas. If outside of the health system, 
there's a lot of other medication related problems. And I'll just mention two areas very quickly. One is uh, if you look at schools, they have a huge problem with managing medications. Kids are coming into schools all the time. They've got meds, they've got asthma meds, diabetes meds, EpiPens, all this sort of thing. And it's kind of a free for all. There's not any kind of organized way to make sure that those meds are managed appropriately in school. So we're thinking about, is there a way we can create some solutions there? The other one I'm thinking a lot about is what can we do with the, uh, op to, to help with the opioid crisis and the opioid deaths. And the model I'm thinking of right now is the model of the automated external defibrillators. So, you know, 10 years ago, if you w went into places, you wouldn't see these, but you see them all over the place now because people realized if you wanted to save lives, you had to get that defibrillator available faster. And that's what has to happen with naloxone, with opioid deaths. So is there a way that we could potentially deploy naloxone at strategic places to help reduce the number of uh, opioid deaths? So you would have naloxone all over the place. That's what would happen. The would difference is defibrillators expire. You know, our defibrillators don't expire, but naloxone does. Exactly, which is why you need a what I call kind of a small, smart, connected storage device so that it could be monitored. You'd know when it got used, you'd know if it was gonna expire, so it could be replenished right. and that sort of thing. We know how to do that in a hospital, but now we have to think about how could we extend that outside right. our hospital. Cool ideas. So other cool things that you do, uh, you're, you're really involved uh, actively with ASHP, as you've already mentioned, publishing in, in AJHP, but also in FIP, which is a, an international pharmacy uh, organization. You wanna talk about why do, you, why do you get involved, particularly with the international one? Well, I initially got involved when the dean at the time, uh, George Kenyon, said, you know, we're, we don't have much of a presence uh, internationally. Would you be willing to do something to get involved? <laughs> and I, I looked online, and the next meeting was in Sydney, Australia. And I said, oh, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, that's easy. <laughs> that's a no-brainer. <laughs> I'll raise my hand. So I got involved, and there was a hospital pharmacy section. And, you know, like you probably – I'm sure you've given this advice to the students. Um, you know, if you're going to join an organization, don't just join it, you know, get involved, become active, do something. So I ended up, you know, getting involved in the executive committee, the hospital pharmacy section, and I got appointed to the board of pharmacy practice uh, in that organization. And, you know, to, to be honest, I can't say that I brought back a lot of specific ideas that I could implement at Michigan. But what I did learn is I got an appreciation that everything we do in the United States uh, in the way we practice pharmacy is not necessarily the best. I, I think sometimes we think we're better than everybody. Um, we're not. Uh, we're, we're really good compared to the rest of the world, but we can learn a lot from how other people approach similar problems. Um, and there's, I think, a, a feeling of satisfaction in being able to help uh, colleagues in in more developing countries to help them advance their practice and those are the yeah you always brought people back when you were cpo you'd bring people in and from yeah, all the, the, the friendships and the you know the colleagues that you develop through those things i've always found are you know sort of really enrich your life so uh that's why i did it great but we only have a few moments left again audience if you got any questions Put them forward, uh, and we'll we'll get them in here. I, I think we will close with uh, maybe you with some advice to. This, I have a million other questions. Like for example, I'll give you a quick one. I'd like to know uh, you're a voracious reader. Uh, some of it professional and personal development, and some of it fun. What do you what are you reading these days, or what do you recommend to the audience? Um, I'm reading two books right now. Um, one's kind of an older one. Um, I'm trying to remember what it's called. Atul Gwande's book, uh, Being Mortal, I Being think. Mortal, right. Probably, many of you may have read that. It's a very good book. I had never really read it fully. I've just read excerpts, so I decided I really needed to read it. So I'm doing that now. And then I'm reading a book by a guy named David Goggins, who's a Navy SEAL. And I think the title is uh, You Can't Kill Me or something like that. And really the, the concept is that... Um, as individuals, we probably only 
achieve about 60% of our potential. We don't push ourselves and, and uh, you know, achieve the things that we probably could. So it's kind of an achievement oriented book. It's pretty interesting. He's crazy. <laughs> Good to know. Uh, yeah. So let's end up with so, some advice to the students. If they want to get into a field like yours or either management within a health system or even, you know, really zag instead of zig and go into say a technology sort of thing you know if maybe if you were even a student now what would you be doing as a pharmacy student to, to prep for a career like that what do you think would be effective what do you think's maybe overrated and a waste of time uh i don't nothing comes to mind right now as being overrated and a waste of time but i guess i would say one of two things one is i i wouldn't discourage anyone from uh, pursuing a clinical track, because as I said, I really felt that um, served me well. Um, but if you think, ulti I think when you do clinical work, you're going to start noticing that, gee, we need different tools, we need different things to help us do this better. And that's kind of how it led me to think about all these technology problems that um, and ways that technology could improve. And of course, right now, that's where I am. So if you think that ultimately, you're interested in in technology, informatics, automation. I would say, um, you know, there are residency programs, there's certificate programs, there's master's programs. Um, there's not as many, they're, they're not as standardized. Um, but I think what you want to do is start networking with people who are leaders in that area. Um, <clears throat> ASHP has a section of pharmacy informatics and technology. I'd get involved with that, start getting involved in, in projects and that sort of thing. Sounds great. Uh, would it be okay if audience members uh, contacted you with questions or follow up on this? Certainly. One of the things when I changed, I, I asked uh, the dean at the time, I said, you know, I love being a faculty member, even though I'm going to do this other thing. Uh, sort of on a full-time basis, I'd like to keep a small appointment at the college because I really enjoy interaction with students and residents. So uh, please uh, don't hesitate to contact me. All right, I'm gonna put your contact information on the screen. Uh, Jim's, he's got a great unique name, Jim Steve at med.umich.edu, <laughs> one of the best unique names around. I wanna thank you so much, Dr. Stevenson, for, for being on, um, really an interesting, 30 minutes goes really fast when we do these. And for our next program, we're going to try something different. I'm going to try to do a podcast. So rather than have live audience, Kevin Townsend, who's going to be my next guest, uh, is going to, we're going to sit and talk and do it as a podcast and, and record this. And Kevin is someone who works in the industry track. His whole, well, he was actually at the University of Michigan for a while and then went over to industry uh, and working as an MSL and some other things. And we want to explore that track and that career path uh, for everybody. So if you have any thoughts about that as being a career for you, another way you start clinical and you do something a little bit different, uh, I really advise to, to listen to Kevin Townsend. So thanks again, Dr. Stevenson, and, and thank you, audience, uh, for today. Great. Thanks, Dean Mueller.